may, may not have been done to deceive. So either one may, may, may or may not imply or denote plagiarization. I use the term primarily because of the current climate and claims that are made by people today as opposed to possibly claims that were made by people back then. So again, you ask me, what is it in the Torah that is plagiarized from um, comedic literature? Is that it or from, did I get it right? What exactly did the Torah plagiarize from Kemet? From Kemet. Um, what did concepts, the Torah plagiarize? Concepts, uh, literature, uh, concepts and literature, um, constructs. Uh, can you give us some examples? Uh, can I give examples? Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, the uh, Ten Commandments, at least half of the Ten Commandments. Um, and the other half, not reflecting comedic literature, only at least only uh, at least not in um, at least not from the particular comedic literature in question, which is the forty-two declarations of Ma'at. It doesn't mean that the rest of the Ten Commandments that are not uh, uh, found directly in the declarations of innocence won't be found elsewhere throughout the literature. So, because my scope was limited to the declarations of Ma'at, I would say that we could certainly. Uh, uh, prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that five of them was certainly half. Half is a lot when it comes to plagiarism. Or because if you, if you cheat from someone in a, on, on a test in school, if ha at least half of your answers are reflected that you looked at someone else's work, then this, it's, it's, it's open to question. At the very least, open to investigation. So half of the Ten Commandments, without question. Um, and then um, just uh, uh, as the previous question implied, um, the didactic treaties of uh, of Kemet are found replete throughout. Um, oh, in fact, yes, the example. I have a, a example right here. If you'd like me to give you one, I mean, I had some. Yes, give and then, one. Shall give you one. Shall give you one. Uh, thirty-four. Let's go to thirty-four. Okay. Uh, thirty-four. Let's see forty. Okay. There are claims made uh, at, let's say, the 10th century BCE, circa 950 BCE. This is from Proverbs. Uh, something, uh, a fact, literature that has already been proven to be taken from uh, the comedic literature. Um, that's documented complete, and I'll show that later. Um, I'm going to read from Proverbs. Okay. Yahweh created me at the beginning of His work, the first of His acts of old ages. Of the first of His acts of old, ages ago, I was set up at the first. And this is what the, the writer of Proverbs claims: Before the beginning of the earth, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abundant with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. So there are claims made in this Hebrew literature that if this literature is original, as is claimed by the adherents of the Hebrew worldview or Israelite worldview, then we presume that those claims, if it's original literature, those claims should be found in no other literature predating that if you claim they are original. Why do I say that? Because if I can take those same claims back to ancient Kemet, yet we cannot find those same claims being made anywhere else before Kemet, then by proxy of that, by virtue of that, Kemet has to be given the authorship of those concepts. That is pure rationale, pure logic and reason. Now, I will give it to you from Kemet. The same exact claims being made. This is 1,000 years before at 2400 BCE from the Kemetic text, utterance 572, uh, verse uh, 1466b and 1466d. Osiris was given birth by his father Atum. The same claim is made in the Hebrew text. Yahweh created me. In the, in the Egyptian text, Osiris was given birth by his father Atum, God. The Hebrew text, uh, the, uh, Hebrew text says, before the beginning of the earth. Uh, it says, before the beginning of the earth, there was no depths, I was brought forth. 
right? It says, uh, okay, and now the Egyptian text. Before the sky came into being, before the earth came into being, before men came into being, before the gods were born, uh, before death came into being. So all of these claims of primordial uh, existence are being made a thousand years earlier in a comedic text and then almost word for word over a thousand years later as I've just demonstrated you find it in the Hebrew text. That's documented. That's documented. Can we vote, uh, sure. we vote, we vote really quick because I need sure. you to answer a question Okay. I want to really answer the question. Okay. What is the subject of Proverbs 8, 22 that you just quoted? What is the subject? Because the I, the I is the subject. So what is the I? What is it speaking about? Off the top of my head, I couldn't even tell you because I, I'm okay. not, I'm, I, I'm, I didn't go that deep into the verse. Okay. Um, this goes back to uh, what I opened up by saying. When we don't understand the language that a text was spoken in, right. how can we understand the intent of the speaker? Okay. So Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 through 30 mm -hmm. is an esoteric explanation of the laws of the universe predating the existence of the universe itself something that is currently posited in modern science. When you get into the field of quantum physics, quantum physics tells you that before anything was brought forth, there was the laws of the universe. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 through 30, is speaking about the Torah manifesting before anything was ever made, before anything was ever brought forth, before everything was, was shaped and molded. So, when you look into the, uh, the text of Kemet and you pull out a quote with Atum and Osiris, where Osiris is being spoken of as pre-existing everything, the first thing that I would have to ask you from a point of fairness is, why would you make such a comparison when the Torah is speaking about a scientific fact, whereas the Kemetic text is just talking about an individual who, according to the comedic thought, is believed to have been immortal and existing before individuals. Whereas Proverbs 22.30 is relating a scientific truth, the idea that the laws of the universe predate the universe itself. May I respond to that? You, you have okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's amazing that you would actually sit here and say that in front of me. Well, I'm uh, going to quote. quote okay, so uh, no problem, no problem, no problem. Yeah. Um, what he just gave was was called subject, subjective exegesis. What he did was he gave you his interpretation from what he perceived the, set, the text to be saying. I'm not interested in that. I didn't come here to discuss his interpretation of a text. That's, ex that's exegesis. I'm not here for that. I'm here to discuss what the documentation says. You can read it for yourself and decide what it's talking about. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to tell you and show you what something says versus, in, or rather, contrasted to something else that says something that in, in parallel language. Now, he just made a claim that that text from Proverbs is talking about pre-existence in a scientific term. If it does, why does that text employ a pronoun. It says that quote that I just quoted from Proverbs 8.22, it says Yahweh created me at the beginning. Which means there is a person talking. We are not talking about some general superfluous existence of existence talking. It is a person talking. It is a personage. An immortal. Something that apparently was existing before the earth before the sky, before the rivers. It is a narrative of somebody who is claiming to be created by Yahweh. The same exact thing is reflected in the Egyptian text when it says, Osiris was given birth by his father, Atum. In the Hebrew text, it is given in a, uh, 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 in a declarative statement Whereas in the Egyptian text, it's given in a proclamative context. The person is making a proclamation, where it's here below the person is making a declaration. So one is declarative, one is um, proclamative. 
but they are saying the exact same thing. There is a being that is claimed to be, to have been created by God before the mountains, before the rivers, before the ocean, and before the sky. That is borne out in the text irrespective of what he attempts to superimpose into it, extrapolate or explain to you. I'm not explaining anything to you. I'm telling you what the text says. This is the text. This is not Shaka Amos. The text is a mirror text. In the Hebrew text it says, Yahweh created me at the beginning of his work. Before the beginning of the earth, when there was no death. In the Egyptian text, Osiris was given birth by his father Atum before the sky came into being, before the earth came into being. It is the exact same proclamation. And for him to sit there and pretend that it's not, to try to use subjective exegesis is dishonest and disingenuous. Okay, let me, let me first by responding by saying this. So far, we've seen a switch in the tone of the conversation, number one. Let's speak of passion. And, uh, <laughs> I still love you. I'll take you to lunch. Wisdom, in my opinion, dictates a spirit of discipline, number one. See, I've, I've never lost my spirit in our discourse thus far. Uh, I'm, I'm keeping my calm, I'm keeping my cool, because at the end of the day, I understand perfectly that I'm sitting in a, group, in a room full of brothers. And we are both sharing our understanding of truth. Whether we may be correct or not, there is a certain level of respect in our tonage that we show to one another, number one. So I just want to point that out. Number two, you looked at Proverbs chapter 8 and you began at verse 22. There's a problem with that. Verse 22 clearly isn't the beginning of the chapter. It starts at verse one. So to put it in context and not pretext, because context void of subtext is pretext. So to put it into context, we're gonna start with the first verse. So the first verse of Proverbs chapter eight, verse one says, does not wisdom call out and understanding put forth her voice? She, in reference to wisdom, stands at the top of the high places by the way where the paths meet. She cries at the gates of the city. To you, O men, do I call that my voice may be heard by the sons of men. O ye simple ones, understand wisdom. Again, wisdom speaking. And you fools, be ye of an understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak excellent things, opening the lips of the right ones. They are plain to him who understands and right to him who has discernment. Verse 12. I, again, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find knowledge and discretion. So, so far what we've encountered is number one, the subject, the I, is wisdom. Okay. So, let me, let me finish now. Okay. Because we're going to come to 22 right. and make it make sense. Okay. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, before he had made the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds, the waters, when he gave to the, the, the decree, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundation of the earth, then I, wisdom, was like him as a child. Mm -hmm. What I'm making very clear to you based on the context of the right. text is that we're dealing with an anthropomorphic conversation right. where the spirit of wisdom Right? right, is spoken of from a feminine aspect, number right. one, okay. which when you get into language concepts right. and you talk about wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, yeah. you want to understand that you're talking about feminine principles. Right. That's just number one. Okay. So that's why it begins by addressing by she and her. Okay. And if, as clear, clearly evidence, wisdom is the subject, which I asked right. you earlier. Right. Wisdom right. is the subject. Right. And verse 22 says, I was brought forth before anything was ever made. Absolutely. Now here's the deal breaker on this. Okay. This is a Hebrew text, correct? Okay. In the Hebrew language, the word for wisdom is chakma, okay. which literally means the power to question. It's a compound word. Okay. The first part, kawak, means strength, and ma means what, or a question. So what is the idea? It's the same idea that we learn in philosophy. What do philosophers do all day, every day, which brings them to a point of discernment? They question, they question course, things. Absolutely. So the word for wisdom in Hebrew comes from the idea that we question things to gain wisdom. Right. So, context, right. void of subtext, which is the inner meaning, right. leads to pretext, right. which is the misunderstanding okay, and the miscommunication. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, if wisdom, as the Hebrew text literally says, I'm, I'm not embellishing, not I'm not adding, we not saw that all. that's what it said. Absolutely. We have to understand the Hebrew word. Right. 
Every single Hebrew letter has what's called a numerical equivalent in the Hebrew language. Okay. The Hebrew word for wisdom is composed of the letter chet, okay. which is spelled in Hebrew chet yod tav, which right. has a numerical equivalent of 418. Right. The next letter, my brother, mm -hmm. is kaf, okay? okay? As in chakma, kaf. Mm -hmm. Kaf and pe are numerically equivalent to 100. So, so far we have 418 and 100, that's 518. Okay. The next letter is mem, which is numerically equivalent to Mem yod mem, 90. 40, 10, 40, which is 90. So we have 418, 190. The last letter is the letter He, which is 5. 5. When you take 418 and you add it with 100, which becomes 518, right. and you add it with 90, and you, and you add it with the 5, it becomes 613, right. the number of laws in the Torah. There are 613 laws that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai, not 10 commandments. 613. Well, this happened, but you, you are, no, no, you are I, I, way I, I off that. I did not cut you off. So okay, go ahead. Are there timings on our beach bottles? Are there timings? Because we could just sit here and go on and on. I never cut you off. So allow me to bring it into context. Right. The Hebrew word for wisdom in itself, in its subtext, the inner meaning, conveys that it represents all of the laws of the Torah, which are some total of 613, which is why I tried to tell you in understanding the Hebrew text, it will convey more information as opposed to looking at it from the outside and falling into the trap of pretext. Okay. From the Hebrew perspective, this is talking about the laws of the universe which predate the universe itself, i.e. from the Hebrew perspective, the Torah. Okay. Yeah. Let, me see what it is. okay. Let him switch can. Let's do it. You can okay. Get it. Thank you. Ha! Got it! Ha! Got it! Ha!